Hi friends, it's Annie Grace and I am answering a question today that I got. Um, I'm not going to say who I got this from because it's a pretty personal question, but I'm going to answer it to the best of my ability. And I'm going to answer it based on my own experience and then based on a bunch of research that I've done into this exact topic. So the question is, okay, so my husband saw me watching your video and asked if it was on your behalf. So that's my question. How do you aid a friend or a loved one when you see them drinking too much? How do you encourage them to drink less without offending, which is easy to do because it's a really slippery slope. So how do you talk to a loved one about them drinking too much? And first of all, I'll say, yeah, this is a really touchy subject and I can speak from experience on the side of the person who was talked to about my drinking. Um, and since, you know, one in three households suffer from addiction, this is pretty much relevant to a huge amount of the population and it's enormously important. So for me, when my husband would say something, it made me feel instantly judged and instantly apart. And um, in some ways, being defensive gave me a buffer. It was something else to think about besides my own behavior. So I could be mad at him instead of mad at myself. And um, when I felt judged and separate apart, I already knew that this was an issue. I mean, when somebody's talking to you about something, even if you're pretending it's not, even if you're telling yourself it's not an issue, deep down, you know it's an issue. And I think that we tend to deny it even to ourselves, so we become really convincing in lying to ourselves and therefore to those around us because we half the time believe it. But there are points in our day or in the middle of the night when we know that what's going on with us is an issue. And so defense, being defensive, is much less painful than the other avenue because mostly we're so fearful of what it means. We're so fearful of giving up drinking. And I mean, at the really true crux of it, I think we're really fearful of the possibility that we won't be able to, that we won't be able to get back in control. Or if we are able to get back in control, it's going to mean this life of absolute misery. It's going to mean our identity is gone because somehow we've tied up, you know, being funny or outgoing or having a good time with alcohol. It's going to mean our ability to deal with stress is obliterated and we're going to just be anxiety ridden and miserable. Um, there's so much fear around this that actually being defensive is kind of a padding. Like we can ignore our own behavior longer when we can be mad at somebody for talking to us about our drinking, which seems counterintuitive. But for me, at some point along the journey, my husband, he, he stopped. Um, he stopped talking to me about it and he just started being there for me. And I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how, I don't know why, I don't know what happened, but um, it was really weird, the outcome, because something I had no outlet for my being defensive. For the first time in a really long time, when I was upset, I had nobody to be upset with but myself. And I I couldn't anymore kind of separate my behavior. And it was almost as if there were a mirror. So the only person I could look at when he stopped blaming me was I had to kind of start to blame myself. And um, so that's my own experience, but I've done a bunch of research into this to kind of see, okay, well, what, you know, what are experts saying is the most effective way to talk to somebody? And there's lots of work on this. Um, some of the most effective ways that have been sort of proven are something called motivational interviewing and um, steps of change and whatnot. So the ones that resonated with me the best you know, so on first one hand, I've got my own experience, this idea of feeling pressure, guilt, judgment, apartness, despite my husband's absolute best intentions, despite that he wanted nothing but the best for me. Um, and then the truth being that you can't actually change somebody else's behavior. So change can't be forced, like no matter what. And, and so on the other hand, I've done research into this topic and there's really five themes that I think are somewhat universal in changing someone else's behavior to the extent that you can or in influencing. Really, our job isn't to change somebody else. Our job becomes creating a safe space for them to realize their own need to change, if that makes sense. So first and most important is empathy. And empathy is going beyond sympathy. And sympathy, of course, is like kind of feeling pity, kind of feeling sorry for someone. Oh, you have another hangover. I'm sorry. It's not really about that. It's, it's really about trying to understand and experience the pain of feeling addicted to something. So how in the world can you do that when you're not addicted? Um, I think I'll give you five minutes on some of the brain science and 
some of the things that happen inside the brain when you're addicted, because I think that it's, it's like being in a prison. So you see it from the outside as if it's a simple choice. And sure, the addict, obviously, we've made the initial choice to pick up the drink. We've made the initial choice to drink more than we should have. We've made the choice to expose our brain and our bodies to the substance. But ultimately, over time, that substance has actually changed how our brains function, how our, our, neuros, our, our neurons respond to alcohol. So something gets changed. And, um, and so it becomes well beyond initial enjoyment. So in a normal person who's just going out and having, you know, a glass of wine, and they're not addicted to it yet, um, you have wanting and liking in there together. So you want this glass of wine, and you like it. When you become addicted to something, you want something desperately crave something that you don't like anymore. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. And it has to do with what happens with the dopamine response in your brain. And I don't, um, I think that would be a whole other episode of this as answering questions, which I'm happy to go into in another one. But basically it means that the brain of the addict has been changed through time to believe that the substance is imperative for survival. So alcohol or other drugs become paramount with things like food and water and sex. And we see this in rats. And we see this in other studies where, you know, you give somebody, a rat, for instance, the ability to self-administer whatever we've made them become addicted to. Because by the way, rats will turn their noses up. They won't just drink alcohol if it's presented to them. No, we have to force them to drink it. But then guess what? They drink it and they become addicted to it. And then they continue to drink it and they show all the addictive behaviors that humans do. So, you know, some people in really severe addiction to alcohol will report that they'll drink, they'll puke, and they'll drink more. So they're drinking to the point they're physically ill, but they're still drinking. And I think that this just is the crux of this desperate wanting for something, this desire, this craving, and not even liking it anymore. And this wanting and this craving, it's not just a feeling anymore. I mean, what's happening inside the addict's brain is that this substance has become akin to the things that they need to survive. The substance inside the brain, because of what the chemicals that are being released, because of the dopamine, because of the response, because other things have actually been changed, the prefrontal cortex, which is what you use to make decisions, has become impaired. Um, you know, with rats, they will self-administer walking over a, a electric like sort of plate where they're being electrocuted in order to get at the drug hurt physically hurt they will self-administer to the point where they will starve they will no longer eat they'll self-administer the drug to the point where they will no longer drink no longer take care of their young forget about you know simple pleasures like having sex or just having a good time they won't even be considering those things like the substance becomes in the addict's brain necessary for survival. So at that level, yes, it was a choice originally, but when you really truly become addicted to something, it the choice part becomes much less. And yes, we can make choices to get ourselves out of it, but we have to realize we have to change. So I guess all that to say is that just like exposure to a toxin, you know, could cause cancer. So if you're exposed to too much sun, you can get skin cancer, for instance. Exposure to an addictive substance over time can cause the disease of addiction. And the disease of addiction becomes when your brain is actually rewired. And a, and a disease is caused when an organ is damaged. And so the addictive substance can damage an organ to where it's actually re rewired and unable to focus as it should. So this is so hard to understand if you've never been addicted and never had this feeling of desperately wanting something you no longer even like. Um, because generally, again, people smoke, people drink because they want to. But again, in the attic, that wanting and liking, it separates. And you're doing something you don't like anymore. And you know you shouldn't be doing it, but you don't know how to stop and you don't know how to fix it. And so you justify it. So in many ways, an addict is doing something they hate. And it, it's so hard for us to believe this externally because what does the addict do to your face? They tell you they love it. They justify it with everything they can. And they do that because it's a coping mechanism, because they can't explain why they can't stop to themselves, because they hate themselves for the fact that they can't stop. And because of admitting that they can't stop, they don't see a way out. So the justification almost happens naturally. It happens almost unconsciously. 
it's they're protecting themselves because they don't understand how they got there they don't understand that it's a disease they don't understand that it's not a simple choice anymore and they don't understand how stuck they are so the absolute reality is addiction is a lot like being in handcuffs sure you put them on yourself but now they're on and you've thrown away the key and your life is getting ruined and you don't know how to get out of them and you want nothing more than to escape, but you don't have the key and you don't know how and you don't have the right tools. So addiction actually steals the addict's freedom. It's like being trapped in a maze without a clear way out. And you feel you have no one to blame but yourself. And so if someone else puts blame on you, you can really quickly become defensive because it's so much easier to become defensive and to feel negative feelings towards someone who loves you than it is to feel them to yourself. And um, so empathy is vital and true empathy obviously really comes from really truly understanding addiction. And hopefully that was a little window into it, but it's such a deep complex topic that, you know, happy to answer any follow-up questions on this one. But of course, really, if you can get um, the person that you love to talk, I think that your sincere desire to understand, not with an end game of changing them, but just to go understand what they're going through, I mean, that can crack through the surface like in this amazing way. And once they can say it out loud, once they can talk about how it feels to be doing something they don't want to be doing anymore, um, the whole world can open up in terms of changing. So I'd say, you know, really important number two. So number one is empathy. Number two is just trying to avoid arguments and confrontation and ensure they don't become defensive because it's so confusing for the addict. They feel like they're losing their mind. Like I felt like I was becoming disconnected to myself. Like I couldn't trust myself anymore. I'd set myself rules like, okay, only two glasses of wine. I drink six or eight and, and I didn't get it. Like I didn't understand that actually I damaged my prefrontal cortex after the first two. I wasn't even making coherent choices anymore. Um, everybody blames us nobody more so than ourselves. We blame ourselves more than you blame us. And I think that's really, really true. So anything you do to make them defensive again, it just puts up that protection. Um, so in order to actually make a change, we need to be able to start to see the, the falseness of our rationalization. So if we rationalize drinking that, oh, we need it for stress or we need it for you know, relaxing, we have to start to see the falseness of that. And when we're spending all our time being defensive, I think we don't always just see the falseness of that. So um, here I'm talking number three is like, I get that I'm saying accept and empathy and accept and don't start an argument. And those all feel like, ooh, well, maybe I'm really empowering this person. And all that acceptance can make you as the person suffering through with them feel really helpless. So um, here's one thing you can do that will really help. I, I hope um, there's some research from, I'm gonna read this, Pro Kasha and De Clementes, and it's their stages of change. And they say the first step to change is you have to move from the pre-contemplation stage where you don't realize you need to change into the contemplation stage where you realize you need to change. And so you as the loved one can begin to ask um, questions and just start to talk about how amazing things used to be. And I guess your job is kind of to very gently show them the gap between how things were at one point and how they are now. Show them the gap between how it was when, you know, they had more energy or when they were healthier or when they wanted to do more things or when you were first together, you know, and just simply shine a light on the difference and on what this substance is stealing from them and make sure you always put the blame on the substance, not the person. And if you can try and ask questions and lead them down a path to see how far they've come from being their ideal self, I think that really can help them move into this, oh, there is something more. But number four is provide hope and encouragement because all studies show that even if somebody is persuaded that, yes, I need to change, yes, I want something different, they will not attempt change unless they're hopeful that they can succeed. And I think that is a big one because a lot of us, when we're stuck, we don't believe that we can succeed. We don't believe that we can get ourselves out of this. So um, the belief that change would be impossible or extremely difficult or will require huge amounts of sacrifice to the point where what would even be the point of changing, I'd be so miserable, um, help us overcome that. So 
stories of success, you know, share stories of people just living, you know, a different type of life without alcohol. Um, be really positive. And again, keep the judgment out of it. Just try to try to do anything you can to say, yeah, like, look, lots of, like this is possible, like things will be better um, and encourage them and help them again to remember the good times before before they were really addicted and that life can be good again. Um, and then, of course, the fifth suggestion I have, and I realize this doesn't even begin to cover this massive topic, but the fifth suggestion I have is to, once they're trying to make a change, make sure that you're graceful and forgiving because the stages of being addicted to something to being completely and 100% free of it, it's not a straight line. It's this kind of line. It goes everywhere. And there's, um, there's this idea in our culture that relapse, oh, but you've done so good for two weeks. You haven't had a drink and now you're drinking and you pour the shame and guilt on them. That takes them backwards. You know, that, that goes backwards. The, the story is, holy shit, you haven't had a drink in two weeks? Who cares that you drank tonight? You know, you know you're better than, like, you know you're on the right track. Like, this is amazing. Look what you've already done. You know, focus on the good things. I mean, in parenting, there's something that's really profound that my husband and I try to practice. That's like, you know, your kids were created to be these amazing little beings, right? And all, your job is to show them all the greatness they have inside of them. So your job is to show them like when they do something that isn't in line with the greatness that you know that they can be, it's more of a, oh, well, you know, is that really something you do? I mean, you're so much more than that. I've seen you be so kind, you know? And, and so it's really an encouraging, really, truly focusing on the positive rather than a, oh, well, why did you do that? Why did you drink? You had made it so long. And I mean, feelings like that just, again, they go back to that, well, we'll feel like it's impossible and we won't even want to try because we already feel so stuck anyway. So um, being as graceful and as forgiving as possible and realizing that it is part of the journey. You know, even years later, you know, people need to see, well, Am I really missing out on something? Let me go get drunk and see. I mean, this is an individual journey. It's not your journey and you're there to help it as much as possible. Um, and studies show that loved ones can be massively helpful or massively damaging depending on if they're adding to the guilt and shame or if they're adding to you know, the empowerment and the forgiveness because ultimately we're not going to guilt ourselves into change we're not going to shame ourselves into change we're going to be able to love ourselves into change and once an addict can realize okay there's something worthwhile about me that i can stop beating myself up by putting this poison in my body that i can forgive myself for my mistakes because there's so much shame around the things that we've done to you when we've been drinking um when we've been doing things we shouldn't have been doing like we know our behavior was bad and to face all that is really hard and so but change comes from facing it and getting through it and and you loving us um sort of unconditionally to the extent you can and I don't know much about enabling, so I'm speaking not as an expert, but from my own experience and from the limited research that I've done into this. But I think guilt will hinder the process, um, not facilitate change. So I hope this has been somewhat helpful. It's a really hard question, and I think it's ultimately because change or not happens inside the person. And so as much as you love them, what you can do, um, while it can be very impactful, is ultimately not the hard work of actually changing and actually realizing the need for change, and that's up to them. But um, I think the best way to change, ultimately, uh, is being able to devalue the substance and being able to uh, devalue it in that person's mind, allowing that it is not what they've come to believe it is, and trying to reverse the conditioning around that. But Anyway, thank you so much for the question, and please post any questions or any follow-up questions below. And like I said, I will keep doing this as long as questions keep coming and I keep having a good signal. So hope you guys have a wonderful day. Bye.